Look, it's right there, my friend said. Yeah, right. Right where I looked for the third time now? This wasn't my first mule deer hunt, but it was definitely the first time I ever ran into an invisible buck. <laughs> I still don't see it, I said. Hi there, Spencer Rempel, the Moose Whisperer, bringing you exciting hunting and outdoor adventure stories from around the world. Today's story is brought to you by me and my best hunting partner, Nathan Adrian. Stay tuned till after the story to hear more about this wonderful area where this hunt was performed. But as usual, let's get right into it. Another beautiful fall morning, and honestly, I felt such an appreciation to live in this gorgeous country. You see, I was an avid hunter and outdoorsman living in a very remote and unpopulated southern Canadian wilderness. Nature was literally at my doorstep. I could walk out of my home, jump on my ATV and be hunting in 10 minutes or driving a little further to reach the beautiful glaciers and high alpine mountains that were everywhere. Too numerous to count. In these beautiful mountains were mule deer, mountain goat, grizzly bear and elk. The valley bottom holding many white-tailed deer, black bears, cougars, and coyotes. It was truly a hunter's paradise. Not to mention, I was born and raised in them there hills, and every human around was either a friend, a relative, or both. <laughs> I had my choice of hunting partners, and this day I had made arrangements with my very favorite, my longtime friend Nathan Adrian. Why was he my favorite, you might ask? because he knew what he was doing, and hunting with someone smart and experienced makes a big difference. Nathan had the same love for the outdoors as I, maybe even more. And at his young age of 25, he knew more than most hunters twice his age. Plus, we hunted together a lot. And I found that oftentimes our thinking and reactions were incredibly similar when hunting. If we seen game and Nathan suddenly ducked off to one side, I knew exactly what he was doing and where he was going and how I should respond. I think for our age, we were a couple of smart cookies and we really enjoyed hunting together. The year was 1992, 31 years ago now. I was 23 years old and Nathan a couple of years my senior. That day, Nathan was picking me up in his old hunting truck and we'd be heading up the area called Deception to hunt for mule deer. It would be a great drive as we always enjoyed our time together in the cab of a truck. Drinking coffee and swapping stories, we were both big talkers and the cab of that truck rarely heard silence. <laughs> I think hunting is a great activity for us because at times it forced us to be silent. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny, but keeping quiet, being silent in the forest is a beautiful thing. Perhaps only us hunters can really understand. For how many people nowadays walk out into the forest and sit dead silent for hours at a time? Well, we did. But we weren't there yet, and until then, our mouths never stopped moving. <laughs> the light was coming up, and it was time to leave the truck and start walking up the old skid trail. There was lots of logging in the area, and it was pretty much the only occupation around there. Both Nathan and I worked in the sawmills, cutting that fine timber from these mountainsides. I love logging, and I could never understand those who, who thought of it negatively or as some kind of destruction. It's a renewable resource that put food on our tables and paid the mortgage on our trailers and bought clothes for our ever-expanding young families. Not to mention, logging opened up the country, giving us roads way back into the most beautiful places you've ever seen. And these places were teeming with wildlife. A logged area was always a place to look for game. The deer and elk would be in there foraging in the new growth that was sprouting up all over. Well, we left the truck and started walking. Still early in the season, there wasn't even a frost and we were dressed lightly with our rifles slung across our backs and binoculars dangling from our necks. Bullets neatly arranged in a handmade leather pouch from a local leather artisan. I was also proud of the antler-handled knife on my belt, handmade by one of my schoolmates' dad. That's how it was in those days, a time before Amazon and online shopping, a time before internet, a time when you wanted to learn something, you had to go find someone or bug your uncle or your dad for answers. Hey Siri didn't exist, and the closest thing I had was a telephone, where I could punch in a few numbers and then say, hey dad. How do you fix this? <laughs> or whatever problem 
or whatever other problem or dilemma I had. Looking back on it now, those were special times. We hadn't walked that far, maybe two kilometers up and to the south. Ambling along the road in silence, our eyes peeled for any movement. As the road crested the top of the hill, Nathan suddenly stopped dead in his tracks, extremely fast, and his eyes shot open to the size of saucers. <laughs> well, he definitely sees something, I thought, and looked in the direction of his gaze. Absolutely nothing ahead. Ahead lay only a logged area with downed trees and willows shooting up everywhere. I looked back at Nathan, who was now looking at me. I gave a silent shoulder shrug to implicate I hadn't seen anything. Nathan looked back to the field for only a split second and then looking back at me, still wide-eyed, placing his, his hands on his head to indicate antlers. <laughs> Again, I turned my head towards the cut block and seen nothing but stumps, willows, and a big tree laying over, ah, maybe 80 yards away. I looked back at Nathan, who was now becoming completely unglued. His entire body was vibrating and he was pointing straight ahead, back and forth, so many times. And with such force, I thought his arm would fly right off. Again, I moved my gaze in the direction of his frantic pointing. And again, there was nothing. I was starting to think my hunting partner had lost his mind. It was my turn to shoot and I appreciated him giving me first crack, but gosh darn it, Nathan. There isn't anything there. <laughs> I looked back at Nathan, shrugging with a very confused look on my face, and he whispered, right behind the log. Well, I knew exactly where he meant as I had looked at it four times already now. For the fifth time I looked, and this time the timing was right. My head turned to look at the spot just as the buck's head rose from behind the log. <laughs> you see, that downfall log was about exactly the height of the buck's back. Nathan spotted his neck, head, and antlers, but each time I went to look, the buck had his head down grazing on some fresh grass. As I looked towards Nathan, the head would come up. <laughs> Nathan's eyes would just about bulge out of his head, and as I looked over again, down the head would go, and I would see nothing. <laughs> but ha ha! Luck was finally with me, and now I seen him clearly at only 80 yards. Heck, maybe it was more like 60. A head or neck shot was going to be easy. One thing I couldn't get out of my mind was how did this buck not see us? There were Nathan and I standing in the middle of the road on top of the hill, not 60 yards, completely in the open, with Nathan flailing arms, pointing and making signs on his head. <laughs> oh well, never mind time to make the shot. His head was up and through the scope I could see him chewing grass and paying me no mind whatsoever. Boom! The shot rang out, taking him in the neck and hitting the spine and he dropped like a sack of hammers. Woo! Nice freehand shot. Not a trophy buck but a nice four point whose antlers I could nail to the side of my shed and meat that would help fill my family's freezer. Woohoo! Nice one! And we're high-fiving each other with great excitement and joy. Funny that deer didn't run away, Nathan said. Yeah, I know, we must be really camouflaged, I jokingly stated, as we were wearing old work clothes and didn't own any fancy hunting attire. We made our way over to the deer and all was revealed. Hey, look at this, Nathan said, showing me the damaged and blind left eye of that mule deer buck. I thought, he must have lost an eye while fighting with another buck. But my thoughts were interrupted by Nathan's grand, boisterous, long horse laugh. Ha 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 Look at that! I must be the best hunting partner in the world, Nathan said. I even found a blind mule deer, so even you could shoot one, he continued. <laughs> laughing and laughing and laughing. I thought to myself, Maybe this guy isn't my favorite hunting partner after all. But then I found my sense of humor and joined in the laughter as he continued to tease me as we dressed that blind buck out. <laughs> Wait a minute, half blind buck. The day was beautiful and Nathan and I enjoyed our conversations as we skinned and cut for the next hour. To this day, Nathan still always asks me if I found a half blind mule deer to shoot or if I feel like I could graduate to a fully sighted one. <laughs>
Having a hunting partner is a great thing, but be prepared to get razzed and teased like only the way a friend can do. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan, for that wonderful hunting experience and good times. All right, as promised, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the area that this excellent hunt took place in. This was a little unincorporated village called Meadow Creek, and it's right in between two beautiful lakes, Kootenai Lake and Duncan Lake, and the famous, to us, Lardo River. They call this the Lardo Valley. It's kind of a rare place where there's some nice farmland in between the steep mountains. We have the Selkirks and the Purcells on each side of us, an endless stretch of mountains with tons of hunting roads that go through the whole area. This is where both Nathan and I grew up. Nathan uh, had older brothers. He was the youngest of the brothers, and they were all accomplished hunters. And they were heroes of ours, as they, you'll be hearing stories from them as they have gotten elk and cougars. And yeah, we got lots more Adrian stories coming your way. This was the place that we grew up in with friends and family everywhere. It just couldn't have been really a nicer childhood if you like that kind of thing, being remote and isolated. We absolutely loved it. You know what, folks? I'd love to hear your stories. That's mine, but I want to tell one of yours as well. Tell me about where you grew up, who you hunted with, about your first hunt, your last hunt, your biggest deer, the nicest bear, whatever you got to say. I'd love to tell that story to the world. Send it into info at themoosewhisperer.com and let me tell it to the world. Folks, thanks for watching. More stories to come.